Terence, welcome to the podcast. Thanks so much for taking the time to have a chat. <laughs> Thanks for having me, Elaine. <laughs> So let's go ahead and dive into it. But before I, you tell us the context in terms of your career story and kind of, you know, how did you come about to doing what you're doing today? Tell me one thing that people don't normally know about you. Uh, I love music. I'm a big love of music. I think a lot of people don't know that about me. <laughs> yeah? What kind of music do you like? And do you uh, play any? I love, no, I, I did take piano lessons way, way long time ago, but I didn't stick with it. But um, I love all type of music, but I really like jazz. Uh, I like r and I like old school music too. So like 70s, that kind of stuff. But it, like pretty much you can just throw out of like a genre or something. I pretty much kind of have a base knowledge of it. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> Nice. So you have an ear for music. That's awesome. Yeah, um, yeah. And I wouldn't have thought about you. Like, I, you know, when, when, when we started to kind of having chats and I always, you know, I, I knew a little bit about you, but like, even before we started recording, I was like, well, you seem like the nature guy. And that yeah. kind of, I would never be like, well, you're the music person. Like you enjoy music. You know what I mean? Like to, to on like a deeper level. So that's, that's cool. Um, so Tell us a little bit about, you know, your your career story in a nutshell, because I always find it so interesting because individuals like yourself have kind of done different things and dip your toes in different areas and kind of to do something you truly enjoy today. I feel like there's always a story. So share that with us. Yeah. So uh, going into like high school, I was still trying to figure out what I wanted to do. I thought I wanted to be like a physical therapist or occupational therapist. That's why I started. And then I took art and my art teacher was like, hey, you real good. And that's before I even knew I could draw. And I, I kind of learned to draw in the art class or just discovered I could. And she like, you should, you know, consider being an architect. I was like, what is that? And then she was like, you know, look it up and whatever. And so one of my English professors, uh, her son was an architect in mm -hmm. Jack. And we had to do like a report where we had to shadow somebody. So she was like, well, since you're interested in the architecture, shadow my son. So I went downtown and like spent the whole day with him. Like we had lunch. I met like his business partners. I saw blueprints. They would build like a school. I went to the site to see that and all that. I was like, oh man, this is great. Yeah. And so that's where my career journey started. I was an architect your major <laughs> well architecture uh uh dropout i guess that's the way to say it <laughs> so uh i spent the first year and a half of college in architecture so we had design um we had uh yeah we had design class well i can't remember the, the official name was but yeah. studio so we had studio monday wednesday friday from one to five so like a four-hour class wow so they were our professor would come in and say like hey you know we want you to mock up this do that so i can build models i can do blueprints i kind of did all that kind of stuff beforehand but our building was like the only one that stayed open 24 hours a day like literally somebody was in our building every day all day mm -hmm. and i missed my whole freshman year like nobody knew who i was because i was in the architect's building every day all day <laughs> you go preparing awesome. models preparing drawing what, uh, what was it about the 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 art piece of it i guess that um excited you that made you want to do it all the time i, I always I, for whatever you know i was like how or like sketching them or drawing them or looking at them or whatever and so that was kind of like my entry point to architecture even before then uh but i like to build stuff i like to kind of do things that way or sketch things or sketch ideas. I guess that's that's a main thing about architecture. It comes from your ideas. Yeah. And whatever you envision, then you try and translate it in some kind of way. Yeah. Uh, but the 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 um, investment of time was so long, I was like, I don't, I don't want to do this anymore. So I changed my made to psychology because that was something that always followed me too. People have always came up and talked to me, even when I was younger. It's like, and it, I'm not talking about people my age. Older people would come and talk to me, like adults. 
Hey you, thanks for watching. If you're enjoying this episode, make sure to share it with friends and family who might find it interesting. Make sure to hit the subscribe button as well to stay up to date on weekly new videos that are going to be coming out with some awesome guests that I bring on. And uh, if you have any questions, use the comment section to ask me questions, to interact. I look forward to talking to you. And they would tell me <laughs> like about their life. I'm like, what, what am I supposed to do with this? <laughs> but it just happened all throughout life. And even yeah happening in our uh in our residence hall and like for whatever reason people find out like where my room was and they would send people they were like hey <laughs> go talk uh, to yeah. parents <laughs> yeah like i'm telling like hey somebody told me i need to come talk to you and like who told you that like how y'all come like how do y'all know where i'm at and so, like, <laughs> i was always kind of like i guess the listening ear for people mm. uh and so I was like, well, people always seem to gravitate toward me and let me go ahead and then pursue that and really kind of uh, get trained in it. And so that was kind of my journey to counseling and being a therapist and all that. It was just something that I, I think from my standpoint, being a therapist or whatever, I think it's something that you are and then you realize it and you accept it rather than learn it from school or whatever. You learn how to hone it in or mm -hmm. be more effective. But I don't think everybody can do that because it takes a, a certain level of caring and empathy and all that for people that if you don't have that, it's hard to be effective. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I think it's, um, you know, when I, and you, you sense it as well, you sense it with good coaches and therapists and, you know, even mentors, like it's not something you learn. It's something that you, it, you it's who you are. And then you just kind of, you take some certifications because, you know, just to kind of uh, build that credibility. But I mean, as you're very well known, no, you know, it, when it comes to therapy, it's either skill you have. And yes, there's certain things you can learn to be a better therapist, but the way you get better is just through a lot of self-reflection, of course, and by just practicing and speaking with people instead of, of course, there's techniques not to take away from the, from the, from the actual uh, technique aspect, but um, I relate to it from a coaching perspective, because when people start asking me or they start throwing their coaching degrees at me and I'm like, but if, you know, if, if you don't feel comfortable, like that shouldn't come, that sh you should, do you know, what I mean? it's not about the certification in the coaching world and therapy. Yeah, like you should have maybe some kind of, um, it's a little bit deeper, right? But in coaching, I'm always turned off by coaches. Like when we work with coaches and best friend, when they start throwing certifications, I'm like, it genuinely doesn't mean anything to me. I need to talk to you as a person. And I will, I will, I will feel if you're, if you're the right coach, right? Um, uh, for our audience and et cetera. So it's not about that. You cannot get a degree in coaching, let's say, or therapy, if you don't naturally know how to connect and emphasize with people. So I, I completely agree. Very relatable. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I agree too. And that's that's something that I, I try and I pride myself in is I let, you know, my degrees or education kind of be in the background. Mm -hmm. So if people want to know, you yeah. know, then they could ask and I can talk about it, but I don't lead with that, just like what you right. saying. I don't I don't need to lead with it from identity standpoint. Yeah. Uh it's just things that I accumulate over time to help refine what I knew or expand what I know or whatever, but I don't look at it like, hey, look at me, look at all these things, you know what I'm saying? Because a lot of people will, won't know, you know, my background and all the stuff I've done because I don't really talk about them in conversation. Right. People ask me a question, then I, I answer, but I don't lead with all of that. Yeah, makes sense. So you started with architecture and then you went, you, you said, okay, maybe my calling is a little more around psychology and therapy and counseling. So you did that and, and mm -hmm. but then that didn't stop there. You kind of continued, you did other things as well. So tell me about that. Yeah. So, <laughs> so I was, so for me, one thing I know about myself, I can't do the same thing for too long. Mm -hmm. So I kind of, I had to have a continuous progression in my life. So that doesn't necessarily mean that I have to go from challenge to challenge, but I do have to continuously learn. And when I feel like I'm at a point where I don't have to learn anymore to operate on the level that I'm in, then it's time for me to shift. So just like 
with five kids. She, so, so it, so it I, yeah, I, I've done a lot of shifting. So I shifted from, you know, my major, and then I shifted from uh, being in different roles in counseling. Cause I started off as a case manager and I was a therapist. Um, and then I switched, I shifted from community mental health, which is more going to people's houses, dealing with schools, being in the school setting or whatever, to the college counseling center. Um, and then I was working more with young adults. Mm-hmm. And so I did that for a while. And then it was like, okay. And then I transitioned to something that I've, I always wanted to do was to teach on the collegiate level. Mm-hmm. And so I made that shift from being more the, you know, person that really worked one-on-one with people to then shifting to helping the next generation of therapists and counselors mm-hmm. and give them the tools and the skills they need. So <clears throat> I spent a lot of time uh, teaching counseling skills and those like practicum internship courses because I really love to do that to give them a real practical everyday sense of like this is what it's going to be as a therapist not from a just a theoretical standpoint it's like this is what it's going to look like this is how your day to day this is how you're going to feel this is what you're going to have to balance with you mm. in relation to dealing with other people and those are conversations that I didn't necessarily have when I was in my master's program yeah or you know and so it's the real life like hey you're gonna have somebody in front of you Sometimes you're not going to know what to say. Sometimes you might not be able to connect with the experience because it's not yours. But what do you do in those situations? Because they're looking to you to be that safe space. And if you're not comfortable with that, then you can do harm to them because you're not confident in yourself. And so that's one thing that I had, I, I built with my students is don't, don't be concerned about what I would do. You need to know what you would do in this situation. Mm-hmm. So, cause, cause, cause even, even my student that I supervise, they're like, you never give me an answer. Like, why won't you just give me an answer? I was like, because if you hear my voice, I can't be the loudest voice in your head. You yeah. should. So if you're hearing me, then you're free. Cause you're like, Oh, what would he say? How would he do it? No. How would you do it? Right. And that's what I wanted them to get more and more comfortable about. Like, hey, you can do this, but you got to trust what you got and your unique skills. You you can't do it my way because it might not fit you. It might not fit your personality, but you got to find that. And I think that's what all of us look for. It's like, how do I use my gifts, but use them the way that fits me, but then it makes it authentic to where when I do talk to people, help people, serve people. Then it's like, oh, well, that's Terrence. Like, oh, that's Elena. Like, it's not me trying to be somebody else. Yeah. You know, that's so interesting because actually, I was, as you were talking, I wrote down a question. And one of my questions, which you actually just answered is, is there some sort of theme that emerges when you talk to individuals and you, and maybe there's more and I'll be happy to hear that as well. But what you're talking about is this theme, which we very much see in, in, in career coaching as well, which is around like people just looking for answers and they just want this magic pill and magic formula. It's going to just give them and they're like, just tell me what to do because it's so hard to actually really dive deep to understand what do I want? And it is one of the hardest questions. What do I want? What, you know, what can I do? How would I do it? And it's so difficult. All there's the answers within us essentially, but it is one of the most difficult questions to answer. And the funny part is that unless you actually put a person on the spot and ask them to speak about it or write about it, we all think we kind of know, as, but as we start speaking, we're like, well, maybe I don't know. Because you are you realize that you're not as convinced as you thought you were in your mind, mm-hmm. right? Like, and, I, and, I, and, and it's just, that, that's what kind of came out. What do you think about that? Yeah, so I think a lot of what, and it, it made me think about this book that I read. Uh, it's called The Four Agreements. Yeah. Uh, it's by... Uh, Miguel, somebody, Miguel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah, so I did talk about it. Yeah. So, um, but what he talks about, and then I think it goes along with what you're saying, 
Mm-hmm. You know, we're younger. He talks about, you know, being domesticated. Like our environment domesticates us and kind of really strips us, strips us of our uniqueness mm-hmm. because we try and fit with the environments that we're around. And so it's like our parents have a, have a certain idea of who we should be or what mm-hmm. life should be. Then our friends and our family and everybody else. And so everybody's trying to, you know, put these different pieces of what they envision our life to be on us. So then it it causes us to tune our own self out. So then that's where we feel stuck and lost. It's not necessarily that we don't know what we want. We just haven't listened to ourselves in so long that we have to then kind of strip everything back and just get quiet with ourselves and just ask ourselves the question like, is this what I really want to do? It's something that now that I think about it, it's something that I used to uh, ask my clients a lot. Uh, I was like, don't think about what you want to do. What do you need to do? Because the need to do is usually the thing we don't want. <laughs> it's the harder decision. Yeah, that's want, a like, good we one. Want, we don't want like money. Oh, yeah. That's so good. What do you need to do? I don't, I don't want to talk about this now. I'm <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> but it's so true. Like, what do, I, what do you need to do? You know, I'm just thinking about like some things like that, that I've been kind of thinking about lately. What do you yeah. need to do? That's so good. I'm sorry. Can you carry on? No, no, but, but it would, it cut across because it's so simple, but mm-hmm. it cuts across your normal filter. It's like, okay, we say like, okay, I want more money. I want to, you know, advance in my career. I want da, 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 da. Okay, well, what do you need to do to actually start to do that? Well, that's the thing we don't want to do. It's like, <laughs> yeah. sacrifice some, we might have to quit some, we might have to move, we might have to, you know, it requires a sacrifice. Yes. And that's the thing. And that's, I had a, I had a conversation with uh, somebody a couple months ago, and we were talking about personal growth. And she said something that made me, I was like, oh, man, that's it. She was like, we prepare people for the goal, but we don't prepare people for the attack of other people that don't understand why you made the decision you made. Oh, uh, yeah, that's good. Because, <laughs> like, I'm trying to better myself, but then people can get upset with you. Like, why you do this? And why you do that? And why you, you know, yeah. you know, you eat this and now you vegan. Like, oh, well, you used to have this job. Now you want to quit. Why? And it's all those. Yeah. And so it's like a twofold thing. So you have to have energy for the shift or the change. Yeah. But you also have to have energy for the people around you that would then not fully embrace it because it's not the you that they're used to. Yeah. And rarely do we like change, (laughs) whether it's happening to us or somebody around us. So a change is a bad thing in most people's minds. So it's just, it's our natural kind of, you know, from neuroscience, we know that any change is just a threat to our brain. And then we just go into like panic mode. And and, and sometimes that change impacts other people and nobody likes that, unfortunately. So very few, very few. Um, So that's interesting. Yeah. Okay. That's a, that's a really good point. Um, and I wonder, so just to pick up on that, I wonder if it's, you know, what do you think of this notion, especially from your, you know, counseling background, from this notion that a lot of times when people try, when somebody's talking to you, especially those that are trying to talk you out of things, it's almost like they're speaking to themselves, right? Because they are afraid of, you know, like they would love to make that change. Let's say you're starting a business, right? Like, and, and people tell, oh, it's never going to work and et cetera. And it's usually coming from people who never tried it who are a complete opposite of what you're trying to be. Um, and, and then they start in, in, you know, injecting these fears, but in fact, it's really just their, them, themselves talking to themselves versus actually, that's why you, know, you say you don't take things personally and you don't take it you know, directly because a lot of times these people are having conversations with the versions of themselves that they maybe wish they could be. What do you think about that? So, I, I, so when you were talking, I thought about some... Um, so for people, people talk from their own experiences. So what I learned to do is to deal with that. Cause I used to get angry and just upset and frustrated with people like, well, why don't you see what I see? And why can't you be, you know, excited? Like I'm excited. I then started to look at people as like, okay, have they like been in that environment or situation or framework that I'm moving into? And if they haven't, 
then whatever feedback they're giving me is from their experience. Mm -hmm. It's not talking against what I want to do. They don't have a frame of reference. So I can't be mad at them for that. So then it's for me to find the people that are doing or moving into the thing that I want to and start to connect and have a conversation with them because mm -hmm. then I'm getting feedback from people that have the experience that I'm going through or that I'm about to go through. So then it, it, it so then it, it kind of helps to place people in your life. I'm not saying like throwing people away, but you know, certain conversations are for certain people in your life. Right. And it's not for everybody. And when you're able to kind of identify that, it makes it a lot less stressful because then you know, like, okay, well, like my friends, most of them are not in the area that I'm in. So maybe just the conversation we have is just like catching up or having fun or laughing about stuff and talking about TV shows. That's the conversation I had with them. But then I had this other group of people that, you know, we are the entrepreneurs. We in this kind of like building something from the ground up, kind of startup life. And so I have those people where it's like, oh, well, look, we've been doing this and we're trying to find people and we're trying to raise capital. Like, oh, me too. And da, 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 da. So then I can talk freer because I'm with people that understand the world that I'm in. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so then I know where to put my energy in a, in a more effective way instead of trying to make people that won't understand what I'm going through understand. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so and that, that, that's, all, that's so interesting. And I think, you know, as much as we sometimes we, we know these things, but we constantly need reminders. Because especially about, you know, when we go for advice for people that we respect and we like and, you know, that are in our circles, but we have to remember that, like you said, it's just everybody comes from their own experience and the intent is never to hurt. It's rarely right. to hurt somebody or to say something bad. It's just they're coming from their experience, right? So it's, which is, again, why I'm like, personally, I'm a very huge fan of coaches and therapists and mentors because it's unbiased opinion and it's a neutral mm -hmm. opinion that they're, you know what I mean? So it's, it's I myself have all three at, at different times of my life. So yeah. it's, um, it's I think I think it's very valuable. It allows that space to kind of reflect in a, in a way that's not kind of tainted by other people's experiences. So it just mm -hmm. creates that space. Um, so for you, I'm just curious, like, you know, I, I assume what you do gives you a lot of purpose, right? Because you, you, know, you kind of you've came into this career essentially so it was already kind of part of you and then you just you you essentially just it was a hobby almost and then you created it into a career and then a, a business as well so what what is what does it do for you I guess on an individual level maybe not what does it do for you is not the right question I guess but what drives you what drives you to to do what you do so for me um I guess the drive comes from me being a work in progress or kind of like being a lifelong student. I just feel like it's so much about myself that I'm still learning. And I think that's the driving force. Like if I really, really got in tapped in, in tune to really all the gifts that I have and all that, like what would that look like? What would my life look like there? And so I think that's what I'm not necessarily chasing, but I'm trying to embrace that more and more like, hey, how can I be more effective as me? Not just from a productivity standpoint, but just like, how can I really like unlock everything about myself? Because that's, that's one thing that uh, I really truly embrace is like, by the time, you know, at the end of my life, like in my old age, I don't want to look back like, I had so much stuff I could have did and I didn't. Like, I want to look back like, I did it. Like I, I, everything I had to give, I gave and I'm satisfied. Mm -hmm. And I think that that would be the greatest gift for me where it's like everything that I want to do to contribute, I did it. And I did it in a way that was authentic to me. Uh, so I think that's it, but not being like boxed in by anything. So like, even though I talked a lot about my like counseling career and, and network, like I'm a big techie. Like I like said, I like food. I like travel. You know, so, so there's a lot of other aspects of me that I still want to explore and do things with. Like mm -hmm. even with the tech side is like, well, how do we blend the technology and those counseling concepts and like 
bettering people and doing it in an effective way. Because there's so much stuff online, so much we watch or interact with that's not beneficial to us. Like, well, what if it could be be ways to kind of create content or services with technology that really betters people, but it gets them off the screen and back into life. And I think that's where I'm at now. It's like, okay, how can I use the creativity or use my teaching skill or counseling skill and all these other things I kind of collected over time and then integrate them into something new mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. do it a different way or do it for people that may not ever go to therapy or counseling or it may never get a coach, but they need something. And so for me, I see... I see more opportunities out there to do things. And then, you know, media wise, it's like talking, you know, podcasts, those, those things I want to do. But even in a visual sense, like, how can you do like, you know, documentaries or things that's more, mm -hmm. it's just instead of just being strictly entertainment, can it be edutainment where you're teaching and entertaining at the same yeah. time? So it's like, that's kind of like where my mind goes. Like, for the next 10 years, it's like, it's more content driven. Like, how can I create things that can be in better uh, people in different ways? Yeah. Yeah, and I, I think that there's especially, I mean, now it's changing a little bit, but I feel like, you know, just even five, 10 years ago, there's this notion that you do this thing and that's what you do. And it's people almost, they didn't have these fluid careers. And I, I see that today, especially with technology, with use of technology, you can incorporate so many different parts to truly create a career, um, you know, really create your own career. And I always tell people, I'm like, you can really create your own career. Like, just because you've done X doesn't mean you cannot do, you know, Y and Z. And the chances are, if you dig deep enough, you know, you're, unless you've been very specialized in something so specific, like, I don't know, like, aerodynamics I don't know something I'm just making things up now but you know something so specific that maybe it's a little bit harder but even in that case you could probably figure things out <laughs> you could probably figure something else that would be complementary to the knowledge that you gained um, and I think for many many careers you can definitely you know really recreate it and use these skills and experience and towards a future career that you actually Kind of enjoy or maybe i don't know uh you just been wanting to pursue it so i think i think opportunities to do that now are more than ever um mm -hmm. and again just with access right with 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 just being even like podcasting i mean this wasn't a thing a few years back and now from podcasting there's so many ways that you can essentially spread your knowledge and meet people i mean there's just so much i mean talk to people you gain i mean there's just so much that i personally gain from podcasting like just on a, on a connectivity level with people and just the learning experience alone, it's like, it's like media training on its own, <laughs> right? So, and, and so it's, um, and anyway, but and it wouldn't be possible 10 years ago or so, you know? So I think it's, I think, I think it's, it's, it's um, I, I think more people should kind of pursue that. But I think that we're not, we don't talk about it enough. We talk so much about being specialized. We don't talk about how can you transition your career into something else yeah yeah they're just like and we talk about it in like like a career sense but not a purpose sense you know we talk about transferable skills for another job yep. but we don't think about it in our experience like our life experiences like we got transferable things we've gone through and we can apply to the thing that we really want to do that's really where a lot of people start with businesses or like projects or whatever it's something that they're passionate about it went through and they don't want other people to go through it and so I, I think that's why life purpose is so big for me because I just know one I was horrible at taking care of myself <laughs> which affected how I could go forward I was real achievement driven for a while and then you get to the top of the mountain and then nothing up there and it's like oh I don't like this yeah. and then it's like uh well how do I be a human first and then as I'm a human just connect with people on a human level because I think like you were talking about before we use our diplomas and degrees and certifications as a barrier for people it's like hey look how far I'm away from you yeah. and that's not that I, I've never seen like my degree being that it's it's ways for me to then 
give more information back. I always I always feel like education is not for me, it's for people that I come in contact with mm-hmm. to need how to do that. And and that's why teaching, I love this so much because I can sit down, I can watch something, or I can read something, I can read an article, I can read a book, and then give it back out on a week to week basis. And I loved it for a while. <laughs> Until, until I made a shift and quit that job, with, with uh, I quit my teaching job, which led me to go full time in our progress. And so, yeah, I got multiple yeah. shifts on my, on my timeline. <laughs> so, but yeah. But and, and I think that's important because I think that, I mean, again, I'm, I'm obviously uh, uh, as for others, I'm also speaking from my experience. My experience, but I think that the more at least again in my case the more I try things the more I realized I could do and I realized how much I don't know how much potential I realized that I might actually have versus if I were to just keep myself in this one box right so I think just being curious I was actually talking to to somebody else um uh, Charlie on Olive on, on the on a podcast and she was saying that you know it's almost like you need this curiosity and courage and there was another C that she mentioned, I forgot, she's like three C's, curiosity, courage, and I forget the other one, but, um, and, and to, to, to do that, and I think as long as you stay curious and courageous, you know, you, you, every step, every time you make a change, and you're like, I don't think I want to do this anymore, let me try this, and every time you do that, you build that resilience, you build that muscle to be like, well, actually, I can do many things, and I wonder what else I can do, and you, you start to put the pieces together of the puzzle, and I, I, I talk about this in, 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 in previous conversations as well. Like I've done so many jobs and I had no idea what I was doing. Like I just, I, I was like, I just don't want to do this anymore. And I felt like such a loser at the time because I was like, I saw people around me that had all these successful careers and they just knew what they wanted to do and where they wanted to work. And I just felt so behind. And I, and I used to call myself a late bloomer all the time because I used to just be like, well, I just, you know, I'm not where I am according to society standards, you know? Um, but truly, like you said, it goes back to the purpose to being able to go to sleep and be like, you know what, I'm just, I'm just happy, like doing what I'm doing. Like this gives me so much purpose and, and that is success to me. Um, and, and I think that you're right. Um, you know, there's a certain level of success that you reach and you expect that there's something there, but unless that success is on your terms, and it's rarely, and we know this from studies and psychology, that it's rarely about that paycheck, because as long as you kind of have the basics covered, like your food and shelter and all of that, you get X number of dollars every year and, you know, you're just overall okay. Whenever you make anything more than that, it doesn't really bring you the happiness that people search for when in fact that purpose actually might and usually does. Yeah, yeah. And I think it's just having one, one overarching thing for your life so for me I'm a creative at heart and so like creativity is a part of that but I'm always looking at innovation or like how can something be better or do it in a different way so some people do it just because it's like you know that's a buzzword like innovation and all that kind of stuff those are buzzwords now but like literally that's how my 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 mind operates I'm always looking at how can something be different and be better um, and, and, and more streamlined. Mm-hmm. And so I've learned to kind of like embrace that and lean more into that. But every, every step of my like career journey has always been, how can I gotta do this a little different? Like even when I was doing case management or counseling, like that was one of the things that my clients would enjoy because they never knew what a session was going to be from week to week. Cause I always was bringing something new. It was like, I, I, I remember one time I had one of my clients, um, she was, uh, she was going through like a lot of relationships and I was like, she got all these walls up. That's what I was thinking about. And I told her like a week or two before we did, I said, Hey, I got an idea to do something. I said, but I'm going to tell you before we do it. And then if you want to do it, you want to try it would do it if you say no I don't want to do that that's fine I was like but I think this might be what you need and I just got that got a visual of her actually being like in the middle of her emotional walls Mm. and so I I did a session so I kind of debriefed on it then we did it that week and I was like hey I like okay I want you to stand in the middle and I found like poster board like all that kind of stuff 
and I kind of had four walls around me. Mm -hmm. And I was like, hey, all right, now in order to, and I was like, you got to remove it. So I sat outside of the four. And so I was like, in order to remove the wall, you have to name what that wall is and mm -hmm. say what you need to say to it. Mm, that's so good. And then once you feel like you said what you need to say, then you go and you remove it. And so she did. She, she spoke to like each one of the walls. And then, so she was just this. I was like, well, how you feel? She was like, I, I feel like exposed or whatever. I was like, yeah, because mm -hmm. you don't have all these walls up around you. Yeah. And so it was just like something real simple, but it was impactful. And it was just like where my mind went. So I was interpreting what she was giving me. And I was like, how could I do this in a way that would give her a different reaction where she was like, oh, okay, that's what this is what it really feels like, what I'm talking about. So yeah, so it's like leaning into that and doing things in a in a way that people might not get at first, but the people that it's made for, they instantly get. It. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's just something about visualizing, not just visualizing, but putting that a tangible thing in front of you right like so that you remove and and sometimes it's visualization exercise where you like envision like removing certain obstacles out of your way but if you have a physical thing that you can essentially remove that's also i, I think that would be super helpful um i can only imagine so because you actually it's you're getting it out of your head and i think that's what like that's what i always think of like counseling and therapists just getting out of your own head and 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 talking through things and maybe just working through things versus just being in your own mind all the time, mm -hmm. uh, which which can get messy. So yeah, <laughs> uh, for all of us, <laughs> for all of us. Um, but um, let me just ask you also. So um, the work that you do could be quite heavy on 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 yourself as well because you, especially being an empath, I'm sure you take on a lot of people's energies. So in terms of your habits and routines like that you do on a daily basis and just managing the ups and downs, is there something specific that you do every single day that helps you maybe around well-being or whatever it may be? Yeah. So every day I go walk. Uh, I used to run. I used to do like two, two or three miles running every day. And I did that up until maybe about three years ago. Mm -hmm. And I think I was at a point in my life where it's like I needed to slow down. Like everything was just so on the routine. Like I said, I'm a, I used to be a Blackberry, uh, you know, fanatic. And I had all my meetings. I'm a Blackberry. I was one of them business people. Yeah, I was one with the track ball and everything. So I was like, man, I can't keep living like this where it's just like I got eight meetings and back to back to back and I'm just like on the go, go, go. And so I started doing nature walks. And, you know, with them, I just kind of go and I, I, I kind of block time out to where I don't have things like in that part of my day. Mm -hmm. So I don't have to say like, hey, I need to be back in an hour. If yeah, I want to yeah. walk for two hours, I can do that. If I, you know, however long I want to just go and walk. And that's my, that's my time to like process. Like that's like my spiritual time, my time with God or like meditation time. Or I might want to listen to music that time, but it's that grounding thing. And especially if I have like, you know, a decision I'm trying to figure out or I got a meeting or something like that later that day, that'll kind of help clear me or help frame things like, okay, what I want to say or what I want to talk about or like what are some different things to kind of consider as I'm preparing for or it might be some things that I just been holding on to from previous you know days or weeks or some stuff going on I need to clear out before I get you know to that meeting or whatever I got to do that day so that's one journaling I don't do it as often as I used to but it's a book uh I'm a, I'm a book person so um, it's called The Artist Way by Julia Cameron. One thing in that book, and I, I did it faithfully for about a year, but what she talks about is doing morning pages. So morning pages, you get a notebook and you write three pages of words down, unfiltered. You don't have to punctuate it. It doesn't have to make sense. It is you, whatever's in your head, you get out in the morning. That's what they call it, the morning page. And you just hand write them and then you just go on with your day. And so one of the things that happened, and it happened for me too, 
the thing that you write in your morning pages start to happen because you then start to write about what you really want. So as you start clearing all these things out your head, you have to start right now what you really, really want to do. Like mm. when I first moved, we moved back to Jackson, I, I was like, I wanted a house. And so I was right, I forgot that I had wrote about all that stuff in my morning pages. And then I looked back like six months or a year from then, I, read, I was like, oh yeah, I wrote about that. <laughs> like I wrote that I wanted that. I, I wanted to change that. Like a lot of stuff I wanted, it came out through that. And that was just a simple thing, even though it takes about, depending on like the notebook or if you're doing it in a journal or whatever, like the size of the paper, it might take a little longer. But I would say if you're going to do it, just leave like an hour or so in the morning to just sit down and just write. Yeah. And, and like, and don't edit yourself. Like, don't try and make it make sense or scratch out like you got mis misspelled words. It don't matter. Just write. Yeah. You know, that's so interesting because so I'm, I'm a huge fan of journaling. Um, you have to know something about my, me. I didn't come into the world of personal and this professional kind of development in terms of like more on personal side, I guess, until really like towards more towards late 20s. I was always like a fan, but I didn't really get into it um, until until actually my divorce. And because at that point I was like, oh, well, I really need to figure my my stuff out because now it's just me. And and at that point, that was like a, a tipping point for me to say, okay, I really need to take this a little bit more seriously. Um, and the interesting part is that when I first started journaling, you come into realization of how much thought that is not necessarily healthy happens in your mind. And it doesn't always have to be negativity, but it's even the fear of writing down things that you want so you're almost afraid, like, you're like, oh, no, but I can't have that. Like, the, why? You, 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 you like, you want it, and then you write it, and you're like, and you almost feel nervous that you're actually writing it down. And it, I don't know how to explain. I'm sure you, you know this. Yeah, yeah, I know what you're talking about. But, yeah. but, but <laughs> do you get what I mean? Like, and you, you're afraid. You're afraid. And I'm like, and it took me a while to process because I'm like, well, if I'm afraid to even think it and believe in it, how can things ever happen, right? Yeah. Yeah, no, and that's that's when you made me think about some. So uh, it was a couple of years ago. I was I was in therapy. I had my therapist, and one thing she suggested to me, she was like, journal. She was like, I know you you journal all types of different ways, and for so many years, she was like, but you never done it with your non dominant hand. She was like, since you're right handed, right left handed, mm. and then that a kind of. Uh, like diffuse your brain from overthink, overly thinking about what you're going to write. And so I started to train. So really, I write now with my left hand. <laughs> I got to talk myself how to write with my left hand because I've been a right, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm right-handed, but I journal and pretty much write now in my left hand. And so it allows me not to think about what I'm writing. I just write and just let it come. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's another kind of life hack thing you could do too so yeah. if you if you that kind of person you you extra critical about what you write or like oh I shouldn't say that or whatever like you might want to switch it and start writing with your non-dominant hand so you're too focused on actually writing the words down instead of thinking it but like you're too focused yeah that's a good that's a good tip that's interesting yeah. Yeah. um so uh, where do you typically hang out where can people you know get in touch with you if you're interested maybe you know if you're writing anything these days in terms of articles or blog posts where can people find you so um they can the the most frequent place i am right now is on medium so i do articles on there um so uh it's medium uh dot com backslash life excavator should be or at life excavator you can find find me there um i did i did um like it's been what about four months now but my my dad recently passed in november and i did an article about him on medium um and i just wrote it just really for myself i really wasn't planning on posting it but i did post it on facebook and one of my um, writing coaches, she has a newspaper down in Jackson. She saw it and she was like, hey, you need to publish this. I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> so uh, so we were kind of going back and forth with the editor trying to get that ready. So that was published last week. 
Um, and so, I'm sorry for your loss, first of all, but I'm uh, sure it, it created powerful, um, um, powerful messaging, whatever that I'm yeah. definitely gonna read it. Yeah, so um, so if people want to check that out, they can do that. And so it's just me talking about my dad and um, and just like sharing different stories or whatever like that. So um, that's another place that people can kind of connect with me. We do have our progress. We have our um, Facebook page that you can uh, reach us. You'll see some some things of my my uh, myself that I've been doing or my business partner. So mm -hmm. I'm more of the life purpose part. He's more of the relationship part. So he does like couples counseling and all that kind of stuff. Um, and so you'll see that there. I will be uh, working, not working. I will be releasing the podcast soon. I've been getting it together, getting all my logos and kind of structure and format down. So that's something, hopefully that'll be second quarter this this year. Um, and then, um, hopefully by the end of the year, the book will be done. So that's, that's, the, that's the main thing. But I will start sharing more daily type things or like quick videos. Uh, I am working on, it's a website now called Substack that yeah. I'm working on doing a newsletter through there. So yeah. that'll be called, um, I'm Not There Yet. So that'll be the newsletter and then the podcast will be named I'm Not There Yet. And it's people that feel like they still not there where they want to be, just like all of us. And kind of like that journey and, uh, you know, kind of embracing that you got more of what you need than you think, mm -hmm. but it just kind of fine tuning some stuff. So yeah. uh, that's coming. Yeah, I'm working on that. So I think the newsletter will probably be just short, either audio or video clips of me talking instead of just doing written on that. Yeah. So it'd be kind of like a vlog thing. Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. Looking forward to that. Definitely will be sharing that with our audiences as well. And um, final question for you that I ask everybody, if you had a magic wand to make something happen, whether it's, you know, something around the mission that you, you want to fulfill and that you're doing um, or anything in this world, what would it be? I would say, well, it's kind of like a two part, but they kind of blend together. So I've always wanted my own island. Uh, and so I think the inspiration from that came, I went to Jamaica uh, a couple years ago and I had a chance to actually uh, guest lecture there. Mm. And it was the pace of life that I enjoyed. It was like everybody, they're not in a rush, but they appreciate everything that they have. Mm. And that's one thing that I got from there is like, so they have, you know, I went to KFC over there. They got like Burger King over there, but you literally will wait in line for 15 minutes. Like nobody's in a rush. Yeah. You're just going to sit there and talk or whatever. <laughs> but you, like, don't go there and think you're going to Yeah, yeah. But, um, but it's like, you know how we just go to a restaurant and we get a whole handful of napkins and like, and we don't really need them, but we just get them. Mm. They just give you one napkin they're gonna give you like a packet of ketchup or whatever don't ask for you know it's like they kind of live within their means yeah and i think me that's where ultimately i know i'll be in an island environment uh if it's jamaica i would love that uh, but but uh somewhere like that at a slower pace of life and just you know enjoying life but still doing doing things to help people but not necessarily in the rat race and chasing the American dream and doing all that kind of stuff. It's just like, how can I just be content, but also still be growing? And I think that's, yeah. That's beautiful. Yeah. I think we can all learn to slow down a little bit. So, so yeah, that's a, that's a beautiful way to, you made me, you made me, you made me think about slowing down a little bit as well throughout this conversation. So um, it's a nice way to end the podcast. Thank you so much for sharing and for being guests in your time. Thank you very much. Thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs>